I'm really delighted to be here today to be talking about um, workplace stress and wellbeing. And it is the case, Michael, that uh, things in Australia look pretty progressive at the moment. But I was reminded that um, in 2001, uh, there was a, um, a summit held in Melbourne on this issue convened by Safe Work Australia. And uh, during the course of that dialogue with our social partners, um, some employee uh, representatives stormed out of, of the discussion. Um, so even believing that work stress was actually real uh, was difficult for some people to contemplate. So we have moved uh, a long way and I'm really delighted to be a part of it, but we do have a long way to go. Um, just uh, pay my respects to uh, the research team back at UniSA. The, there are very, the, the issue of work stress is uh, a challenge in uh, economies like Australia. It's it, uh, productivity improvement approaches that you might see put out by the Productivity Commission emphasise reducing inefficiencies and increasing work pressure, reducing job security uh, and stabilising or reducing wages whilst we see at the same time the idea of bolstering CEO salaries and increasing profits and shareholder value. These are some of the societal uh, realities that we are confronting. So the caution is for workers, these kinds of approaches to improve productivity are likely accompanied by a reduction in the meaningfulness of work. You know, why do we go to work? What meaning does it give us? We're not just there to make some, a profit for somebody else. It can lead to decrements in worker health, uh, increased psychological distress, to workplace bullying, to work family conflict and to uh, workers' compensation costs. These uh, developments, you know, that are proposed uh, in society for improving productivity may be at odds with the health and safety of workers and the fundamental human right and the basic ethic of do no harm. There are other ways that we can improve productivity and I would like to discuss some of those. So these are the uh, topics that I would like to try and uh, get through. The state of affairs at the moment, uh, causes of work stress, psychosocial safety climate theory, which I'm going to talk about, the value of psychosocial safety climate, talk about some evidence from uh, New South Wales, and finally some solutions about what I think could be done. So uh, I'll just skip through some of this stuff because we've had some uh, good speakers uh, prior to me that have covered some of these issues. But under the work health and safety legislation at the moment, managers should take reasonable action to identify, assess and control exposure to hazards. Um, we, we've, we do have a harmonised Work Health and Safety Act. It's pretty soft on psychosocial aspects, I think, and um, maybe we could uh, try and put some pressure there to, to make it stronger. It's important that we do monitor and address psychological health hazards and risks in the workplace, and it's critical for maintaining the well-being of individual employees and also to ensure uh, productive workplaces. Some stats from Australia, mental stress claims in the Australian Public Service, for example, increased 88% from 2009 to 2014. Stress claims accounted for 13% of the claims, but we know, everyone here in this room knows that stress claims cost a lot more. They were 43% of the overall costs. In Safe Work uh, South Australia information, we see that there's an increase in the frequency of serious claims um, since uh, 2000 and 2000 to 2001 is mental disorders. And mental health conditions cost Australian businesses nearly $11 billion per year due to absence, presenteeism and compensation claims. Now, this um, research by Beyond Blue has uh, made a big impact around the world, but it is really interesting that uh, w we do value worker mental health, but 52% of Australian workers don't believe that their workplace is psychologically healthy and only 56% believe that their leaders uh, value their mental health. 
And as Sergio pointed out, it, it's not just the mental health that is an outcome of work stress, but also physical health problems like cardiovascular disease, metabolic uh, disease, and of course, uh, depression and suicide. So the causes of work stress, um, so th this is, we were doing some research with some nurses. This is what one nurse did. I've been nursing for nearly 40 years, and I think the pressure over the, over the years outweighs the rewards that I get. But it's still a rewarding career, and it's very collegial. But there's certainly one day out of 10 that I would say, gee, I feel really great today, and I've had a lovely day, and my patients really love me and thanked me. And I've had nine days out of 10 where I, where I say, I felt really pressured today. I felt unsafe at times. I felt overworked. And my patients were lashing out at me. And I'm the person who takes the brunt of this at the, at the end of the day uh, to my house. So the, this is just, a, you know, just one example of uh, where people are passionate about their works and do want to do their work and do want to care, but find the pressures that they're working under render their work meaningless and um, very stressful. And this, I'm still trotting this um, little statement out by a call centre uh, manager saying, you know, the best, the six, most successful cold callers are extroverts. This is the call centre managers. Extroverts because they thrive on interactions with others and psychopaths because they're not emotionally hurt by constant rejection on the telephone when they're ringing you up at home. And so, you know, is this the kind of work that we want to offer? And who is selecting people for these kinds of positions? What are the, are the ingredients that they're looking for? So it, it is pretty interesting, you know, what, what does a call centre aim to do? And one of the major uh, objectives is um, profits. So when we're looking at the issue of worker health and wellbeing, which worker health, is that gonna work? Yep, look at that, just there. We really have to look at the worker in this like massive context of the job, working conditions. These things are under regulation by uh, policies, labour market policies, welfare state policies. And then, you know, within the global context, you know, the, the issue of globalisation and increased competition. And also, you know, within the national system, like the national political power makers, you know, the, the role of, of people like Safe Work Victoria in helping to develop legislations that are going to affect working conditions, also the national culture and also corruption in society. These factors are all factors which could influence what goes on inside the work workplace. So i simply breaking it down. You have to look at the individual in the way the job is designed in an organisation, in an external society. So we can look at the individual, but we, we should also really look to the external aspect of, of the person in society our society, what kind of society do we want? So Sergio um, mentioned some work stress theories, and if you combine the ones that he mentioned, which was the demand control model and the effort reward imbalance model, you come up with something like the job demands resources model, which is, you know, like a, a more encompassing theory. The idea is, is that job demands, um, when, there are t when they are too great, undermine psychological health. On the other hand, if you have high levels of resources, you could have high levels of engagement at work. So demands here and resources here. This is a motivational pathway. This is a, an erosion pathway. But the question for, uh, for me was, where does job design come from? Where do we make these decisions about, you know, what are the demands that you've got? What are the levels of control that you have? And so on. And this is where our theory about psychosocial safety climate um, emerged. So this is an Australian innovation where we came up with the idea of psychosocial safety climate. So eventually, Sergio, you'll have this on your timeline, that this theory was uh, from Australia in 2010. Okay. So what we um, proposed with the, if you know about the psychosocial safety climate, you'll be able to predict the working conditions of the people in the organisation. You'll be able to predict future uh, health states. You'll be able to predict accidents, injuries, workers' compensation, and so on. If you know about these preconditions, um, you would know about future resourcing, engagement, and so on. It sounds like a, a big hope, but we've had a lot of success in this research. If you know about the psychosocial safety climate of the organisation, you'll be able to understand whether or not some maybe inevitable demands that you face uh, might be managed or not, depending on the psychosocial safety climate, and whether or not psychological health will be affected. 
if you uh, are a nurse and you have to face um, uncontrollable emotional demands, if you had high levels of psychosocial safety climate, your psychological health most likely wouldn't be so badly affected. So we can see it has like a primary role here. Primary prevention, we would focus on focusing on the psychosocial safety climate of the organisation. Uh, secondary intervention would be looking at job design and tertiary intervention would be looking at trying to help after problems have begun. So um, what is the theory and the evidence? Well, firstly, just to define it a bit more, it refers to psychosocial safety climate. We'll call it PSC because it's just a lot faster and easier. PSC, okay, PSC. It refers to the shared perceptions regarding the policies, practices and procedures for the protection of workers' psychological health and safety. So it's, you know, if you wanted to understand the climate, you could ask a group of workers, um, aggregate their score and then predict their working conditions. It, it does fundamentally concern conflicting or competing values. Uh, worker health on the one hand and the drive for productivity on the other but they could go hand in hand, but it's a fundamental conflict. Um, this is how you would measure it. It's a 12 item scale, we can measure it with four, but these are the domains, management commitment to stress prevention, management priority for stress prevention, communication about mental health issues, uh, participation and involvement at all levels of the organisation in managing uh, stress at work. And these are the items, for example, Senior management shows support for stress prevention through involvement and commitment. And that's been mentioned by everybody so far about how fundamentally important uh, management commitment is to stress prevention. The next one is priority. Senior management considers employee psychological health to be as important as productivity. And then communication. There's good communication here about psychological issues that affect me. And finally, participation and consultation occurs with employees, with unions and health and safety representatives. So there's, there's good uh, information coming from all sources about what the issues are. So if we ask workers about these um, issues and we give them a score, we could predict a whole range of different outcomes. And so I'd like to just show you the evidence for this. The first study where we actually discovered this concept, we, we, you know, we didn't actually plan it, it, it evolved from the data that we were looking at, was we found, we were looking at work pressure, uh, we were looking at psychological distress, so that's that pathway, the health erosion pathway, and then we're looking at job resources and work engagement. And I'd been looking at those issues for years, and it, this was an intervention study in Victoria in the education sector, and I decided to ask some questions about uh, some of those issues that I just raised. Uh, you know, is there management support for this? Is there communication and participation? And I, I was really amazed to find that those items, which we now call PSC, were the best predictors of, of the outcomes that we really wanted to predict, you know, over and above the, the job design factors. And yeah, uh, and also we could predict sickness absence at the school level. So we were asking people at the school about the PSC. We added it all together at the school level. And then we could predict individual levels of psychological distress. So it was over this method means that it's beyond the individual's perception as to this, the actual source of the problem. The group can see the problem. So PSC predicts future work conditions, psychological health and engagement. Then in another study of remote area nurses, we, we measured the psychosocial safety climate at time one, and then uh, 24 months later, we, we go to go back there to re-administer our survey. The best practice would be to ask the same people. But this is a highly stressful occupation and most of them had left. So what would we do? We thought, well, if, if psychosocial safety climate is really a climate measure, then it shouldn't really matter who answered that question as to predict the working conditions of people two years later. So this, this data was from different nurses. So, so yeah, this was measured by one group of nurses and two years later, these factors were measured from other nurses. And we could still predict working conditions two years later in other nurses. So this is really remarkable, I thought. We managed to get it published in a very good journal, so that was good. And you can see, from what Sergio was saying, you can see workload and job control 
These are aspects of the demand control model that he was talking about before. So here we show that this construct can predict these factors that we, we always focus on, but I'm suggesting we should focus even further upstream to psychosocial safety climate. So it predicts, again, future work conditions, psychological health and engagement of other workers. And recent work, uh, again, with nurses, we found that psychosocial safety climate, over and above their physical safety climate, predicted registered work injury via emotional exhaustion, and also not only work injury, but also under-reporting. So if there's high levels of, or low levels of, of PSC, this is going to influence the under-reporting uh, of work injuries by nurses. So that's an important uh, thing to be thinking about as well. Uh, my, son, my son sends me these photographs of PSC when he sees them around. <laughs> So if you ever see photographs uh, in the community of PSC, just shoot them through to me because I think they're really cool. Um, I have no idea what it means. It's probably some toxic agent that's sort of in that barrel or something. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, so uh, yeah, this PSC construct, we've, we've found evidence to show that it's related to mental health, to physical health, uh, to sickness absence, uh, to injury claims on the one hand, and then engagement and productivity. So this is... This is the, the productivity side of things. Actually, if you increased PSC, you would increase productivity. Uh, integrity, it's related to the integrity uh, behaviours of workers. It's related to uh, anti-bullying and harassment, and it's also related to retention. And we've got a lot of evidence for this, which is uh, at the end of the um, presentation. One of my students is just getting all the evidence together and showing that not only are these relationships um, evident at the individual level, but also at the group level. So you could predict, um, you'd have psychosocial safety climate measured at the group level, uh, like in a work unit or in a ward, and that would predict the, the job demands in the ward on average. But you could also have psychosocial safety climate as assessed at the individual level, and that could uh, predict how an individual sees the job demands. And I think that's really important. I'm talking about PSC as a group level phenomenon, but also an individual in a group might see it differently. And I think that discrepancy is something worthwhile looking at, and something that Louise, no, not Louise, it starts with an L, Caroline. <laughs> it had an L in there, right? <laughs> Caroline, uh, you, you know, like when, when you become mentally distressed, you, when you start to see things differently, that, that's also uh, something to think about because that's an individual seeing the context differently from others and it might um, be a, a warning sign. In, in hospital study, uh, we asked the nurses in the ward to rate the psychosocial safety climate, so that's the blue, and then we asked the leaders in the wards to rate their leadership on those psychosocial issues. So, you know, do you show support for stress prevention and intervention? Do you do this? Do you do that? Some of them scored 60 out of 60. It was incredible. They, they were rating themselves as being very, very good at this. And you can see that the, the yellow ones is how the leaders rated themselves, and the blue is how the um, nurses rated, them, rated the situation. So you can see that it's really different. And why this is important is because if you want to know about the average levels of exhaustion in the ward, the only thing that will predict that is what the nurses said, not what the leaders said. So you can't get the information from the leaders to really know what's going on. You need to get the information from the workers on average to really know what's going on. So there's, you can see the, the participatory approaches which cause leaders and workers to inter interact and have dialogue about this issue more could be a really great prevention strategy. Um, oh yeah, this, this basically just summarises what I just said, but so psychosocial safety climate of the member there would predict future emotional exhaustion. The le PSC leadership was not related to emotional exhaustion over time. And it was interesting that the PSC of the group predicted future PSC leadership. So maybe the, the climate lives on more than... So we think about leadership all the time, but the climate lives on beyond... You know, there's a lot of turnover in organisations. Um, and maybe the climate itself could affect how leaders actually operate. So we need to think about how those th two things uh, interlink over time. This, this one, um, 
is really just showing that you expect here's emotional exhaustion, and you expect that when there's high PSC, that the emotional exhaustion is going to go down like this. But we found that it, it really works like that when on a daily basis, the people are reporting supervisor support. So going back to something that Sergio said about you've got policies, but whether or not they really get enacted is really important. So this showed that on, on average, there was a, a belief about the climate, but if it was enacted on a daily basis, that really helped the emotional exhaustion come down. So it's not just saying, it's also doing. That was the main point of this research. It was published in Safety Science. So the value of PSC, the human and economic case. Um, so what we've done is we've been able to develop uh, PSC standards. So we did some research. We, we looked at the relationship between levels of PSC and depression in workers in the future. And we devised the benchmarks. So this, the score would range between 12 to 60. And if you scored 41 or above, this was a high PSC organisation and there was a low risk for depression, and also job strain, high levels of demand, low levels of control. Um, my colleagues from Germany uh, helped us like now devise a, a fourth one, which is a very high risk of PSC, which is 26 or below, and the thought there is that urgent action is needed there to prevent future dramatic increases in depressive periods, so that's 26 or below. We found that if you could improve organisations from very high risk to low risk, there would be a 14% reduction in job strain and a 16% reduction in depression in society. And this morning I had a quick look at New South Wales data. Um, I found that there were 46% of organisations that were below 41%, 41. Be, be, so they were in the risky category. Um, our colleague, um, the late Mr. Betcher, used the benchmarks to determine, um, on average, the annual sickness absence hours uh, at various levels of PSC, um, the cost of sickness absence for each of the levels, and the productivity loss, and, and then the cost of uh, presenteeism. So two, two lots of uh, evidence there about levels of PSC and, and its cost. So in summary, he found that the cost of low PSC, because it leads to sickness absence, uh, is estimated at 2.4 billion per annum, and the cost of low PSC because of presenteeism, uh, 3.6 billion, and total cost is 6 billion. But this is just presenteeism and absenteeism. It doesn't include medical costs or anything like this. And th this is only those aspects that are related to PSC. What, one piece of research that we've been doing with uh, the big Australian workplace barometer study, uh, we asked people which organisation that they worked in, and then we went to Safe Work South Australia and asked if we could link our data to Safe Work South Australia workers' compensation data. Could what people said about their organisation be linked to this if we knew about the PSC? And we found that it could. And we found that in high PSC organisations, on average, there was 102 days lost for workers' compensation claims. And in low PSC organisations, on average, 170 uh, days per annum. So it, again, it was extremely predictive. And looking at workers' compensation uh, expenditure and PSC, you could see the, the gradients with high PSC to low PSC and then the average expenditure per claim. The average compensation in, in South Australia for claims is 16,000. The average PSC in this sample was 38. Each PSC point above 38 can save approximately $580. In a company with low PSC of 28, we can expect average claim cost to be 22,000 and in a company with high PSC of 48, we expect the average cost to be 10,000. So we can do this kind of estimation now, knowing about levels of PSC. A again, uh, another uh, study which showed the relationship between psychosocial safety climate in nursing homes for the elderly and the, the compensation claim costs as being you know, opposite. And this is uh, from the Australian uh, Public Service who have been using the psychosocial safety climate measure in their annual uh, survey. 
and across 100 different agencies, uh, you could see that psychosocial safety climate was negatively related to uh, sickness absence. So the higher the level of PSC, the lower level of sickness absence. And this is just very recently published, but it, is, it shows that psychosocial safety climate predicts future procedures that might be used to prevent bullying, for example. So psychosocial safety climate is always related to uh, future bullying. So you can, you, if you know about PSC, you can predict future levels of bullying. And this showed that PSC would predict future procedures that might be used to tackle bullying. So you could see that the PSC led to future procedures, which in turn reduced bullying over time. So it's quite nice to show if you did something, uh, there could be an effect. And here, we could show that the procedures would reduce the um, incidence of bullying. We've been doing this Australian Workplace Barometer project, which is, provides national representative data from Australia. We've done it since 2009. But this is the model that we use. So it's a psychosocial safety climate framework. So we not only measure you know, demands, control, rewards, and all that kind of thing, but we also, of course, measure psychosocial safety climate. Yeah, our main funders have been Safe Work Australia, Safe Work South Australia, and three different ARC grants. And of course, it would be lovely if New South Wales uh, Safe Work joined us in our next wave. Wouldn't that be lovely? Okay, so this is psychosocial safety climate, and the blue line is New South Wales. And th we started collecting data in 2009 and the next wave was in 2010, and the last one was in 2014 and 15. So th this is WA, that's South Australia. But it's interesting to see what's going on in New South Wales. So 41, remember that was, no, 41 is, is uh, like low risk for problems. So New South Wales, on average, is, is uh, functioning a bit below that. It's actually getting a little bit better. But remember what I said, even though this is the average, like, there's, you know, nearly 46% of the workplaces are down here and, you know, 54 or so are up here. So it's just an average. So you have to think what else is going on at the industry level. So uh, some of the um, information that we have been able to benchmark against international standards. So this is from the European Working Conditions Survey. And you can see, um, so the blue line is 2015 and 2009 is the yellow line. So Australia is here, so the blue line is almost 10% in 2015 that people are reporting that they've experienced bullying uh, in the workplace. And uh, in 2009, it was on average 7%. Now, the thing about this which is really interesting is that uh, in Australia, we give them a massive definition, like it's a very tight definition, and we even used the safe work definition the last time we ran the survey, and basically we got the same result. In the European study, they just said, like, in your workplace, over the last 12 months, have you had bullying and harassment? And most people would say, well, people would probably rate that highly because it's, there's no definition, there's no stringent definition. So that's even more worrying for Australia that we are so high up here. So what about New South Wales? So this is, you know, in the 2014-15, and New South Wales is the green one, and you can see that's, you know, 10%. Down here in 2009 and 10, it was 7 and 6, so that seems to be going up. It's 10%, that's, that's pretty high. That's a very, very strict def... This is just bullying. I think uh, everyone in Australia has something uh, to do here, something to look at, the issue of workplace bullying. Um, psychological demands, going back to the blue line, you can see uh, increasing in New South Wales. Uh, emotional demands, same. Uh, bullying, going up. Harassment, uh, macro decision latitude, decision making at the highest levels is going down. Organisational rewards is going up. Well, that was after the global financial crisis, so maybe that's a good thing. Uh, work engagement is, uh, well, going up. Emotional exhaustion is going up a little bit. Uh, psychological distress is going up. Uh, depression is going up a bit. It is interesting to look at the industry level data. I'll just quickly go through those. So those industries in New South Wales that have low psychosocial safety climate is the mining industry, the communication services and the property and business services. Those with high psychological demands is education, 
health and community services and construction. High emotional demands is health and community services, education, mining, and physical demands, electricity, gas, water supply, retail trade, construction, and so on. I won't go through them all. We'll, let's look at bullying. Health and community service sector, is that what you'd be expecting? Yeah? That's um, education and government administration and defence. Uh, okay, distress, communication services, retail trade, health and community services, and depression, communication services, electricity, gas, water supply, and mining. So the cause of the cause, going to the context. The, the question, you know, the cause of the cause, like where does PSC come from? Um, we did some research uh, using the ESNA data. That, so sometimes you have to go to the European data sets because they're just like so much bigger and uh, more comprehensive. But we looked at these issues, you know, did they have these procedures? And we, you know, if they had all those procedures, we, we sort of said, okay, that's PSC. That's psychosocial state of climate if you've got those kinds of things. You could measure it in different ways. This is how we would say uh, you could operationalise PSC in this data. And we found that, um, that uh, psychosocial state of climate at the, at the country level, so there's 31 different countries, 31 different countries in this study, psychosocial safety climate on average at the national level was related to worker self-reported health uh, and in turn to gross domestic product. But the factors that were associated with psychosocial safety climate, and I looked at many, many factors, was union density in society. So if the society uh, has strong unions, this means that, that they probably affect the, um, you know, the, the, the various um, labour market policies, the uh, welfare state policies. It's more a, a pro-social uh, economy. And you could see that there were these strong relations to psychosocial safety climate. So that, that's why we need to always think about what's going on in society because that can influence what, can, what is reasonably uh, possible to occur inside. And here we have a Liberal government uh, pushing forward this issue of mental health in the workplace. I think this is extremely important and um, really, really encouraging. So the main reasons that the, the highest occupational health and safety leaders in, the, in that study was a, uh, it's a huge study. Um, let me just check. How many people were in the ESNA survey, Sergio? Hundreds and thousands. Anyway, the, it was the most senior occupational health and safety um, officer that answered these questions. What are the main reasons for dealing with occupational health and safety risks? And the main reason was the legal requirements and requests from employee representatives and absence rates. So there is a, there is a, a role for us to play in uh, making the legal requirements a little bit stronger in this respect. There was some research, a lot of research being done on organisational interventions. It's so important to try organisational interventions. If you can fix the problem, you're going to have better um, effects downstream. And um, my student, Amy Zaddo, she uh, reanalyzed uh, many different studies um, uh, and found that if the study actually uh, used psychosocial safety climate principles when it was being implemented, then you would see stronger results and she found support for this. So, you know, you can just go along and do an intervention, but unless you've got top management support, participation, communication, all of these aspects, the intervention is probably not going to work. And that's what she found that in a high PSC intervention, that the psychological health of the workers improved, I'm sorry, the psychological health symptoms decreased, and in a low PSC intervention, there was not much change. And against uh, control studies, there wasn't much change. So this is really important reanalysis of work that's already been done, applying a different framework over it and seeing that, yes, it can be very effective if it's done really well, according to those principles. Some other studies that we've done which have used the principles which uh, do show a reduction, for example, in an improvement in working conditions or a reduction in job strain in comparison to uh, control groups. Just to say that we, we've already talked about national frameworks and it, it is interesting in the German legislation uh, that they do actually explicitly mention the requirement to assess psychological risks at work, psychosocial risks at work. So some of my recommendations uh, for this is that there should be a greater focus in legislative frameworks for psychological health through regulations. Uh, organisations need to clarify 
Organisations need clarification between the concept of compliance with the law and best practice. Those two ideas came from a lot of uh, interviews that Rachel Potter from our research centre did with a lot of, you know, different policy makers and, and social uh, partners in Australia uh, to come up with those recommendations. There is an important role for national values, or what sort of work do we want, and societal power actors, including unions, management, work health and safety, in PSC development for healthy work. We, we need to rethink the kind of work on offer and the kind of society that we would like to live in. I endorse the participatory problem identification and risk assessment uh, processes, for example, through the workplace uh, barometer risk assessment tool, uh, the HSE standards. I support national surveillance. We need national representative data. PSC is an evidence-based leading indicator and a risk factor, and it's a best target for intervention because it has so many flow-on lower level effects. I think it should be a, a KPI for strategic ethical management. And we should investigate how it's transmitted through organisations at all levels. Work stress, stresses are preventable. We should build organisational resilience hand in hand with individual resilience. There should be more reduction of stigma, as we've discussed, and so on and so on. And number 15, develop ad advocacy for workers with mental health issues to enable them to stay at work to um, stay at work plans to highlight the performance effects when people have mental health issues. And then finally, changing culture and leadership competencies. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening and indulging that rather lengthy thanks. Thank you.